Good morning, everyone. I'm Karen Kanapski, and I'm one of the editors at Shieldwall Media. And I'd like to welcome you to the Construction Roll Forming Show on behalf of the show and Roll Forming Magazine. Today, I'm here to introduce Doug Irby with Axel Nobel, who is going to speak with you about coatings. So, okay, thank you, Karen. Thank you're you. welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Because uh, usually I get criticized by my wife that I either mumble or I'm too loud. So just, you know, let me know what's going on. If you can't hear, raise your hand. If you have any questions, feel free to stop me during the presentation. Uh, I'll warn you right now, sometimes I get ahead of myself. I might get a couple slides ahead. But uh, what we want to cover today is a little bit of history of myself being in the industry. A uh, little bit of Axo Nobel, where we're located, um, employee size, a little company information. Then we'll get into you know what's covered in the gut of a warranty. Um, basically, your pigments for color leads to fade. Uh, resin systems that can lead to chalking or losing film integrity. Integrity, and then I'll show you some pictures. I'll show you what that means. Film integrity could be. For many different uh, for many different reasons and then I'll show you some pictures that we could go on for an hour if we wanted to of what's not covered but it's more general things that typically happen out in the field so but later in the day you could come by and visit us at the booth and we could talk more and um, go from there so a history of myself I kind of put everything into perspective of my kids ages right now so my oldest is going to be 30 and um, 30, 27, 24, and I started in 1991, so 30 years later. And uh, believe me, you younger people in here, time does fly when you get older. And when you start referring to things as decades, instead of what happened last year, it, it, makes, it, it takes a toll on you. But I started at a coil coating company in Greenfield, Indiana. It was a roll coder, it's now owned by Preco Metals. I worked for a competitor of Axo Nobel for a dozen years, and now I've been at Axo Nobel for 12 years. So I've worked for the two largest paint companies, experienced a lot of things, seen a lot of things. I drive down the road and I have extra pictures on my laptop. I was in Missouri a week ago and I'm taking pictures of a Home Depot. It's multicolored and you just, when you're in the industry, you start looking at things and seeing things that nobody else will see. And trust me, all three of my kids can pick things out. So. Let's get started. So, Axel Nobel years ago was a global pharmaceutical company, chemicals company, and paint company. They sold off the pharmaceuticals. And just a couple years back ago, we split into two companies and sold uh, the chemicals, and now we're strictly paint coatings. Now, we're just not paint coatings for metal buildings. The tiger picture there, that is, oh, I knew I'd start doing that. Um, that's an airplane. There's the wings. Wow. There's the windshield. Um, so we have a passion for paint globally. We're uh, probably, I got some coworkers in here, shout out if I get off on the number. About $14 billion a year, 12 to $14 billion a year. Can coatings, house paints, uh, construction products. So basically, started in 1792, over 35,000 employees, roughly 34, 35, uh, were broken up into five major segments, and I just mentioned some of those. Decorative paints, we call decorative paints, that's house paints. Uh, interior, exterior, floor co uh, coverings, uh, marine and protective coatings, <laughs> yacht coatings, shipbuilding, cargo ships, you know, when I got in the industry and learned more about AXO, and my previous employer had one, I always thought, well, you're just building this big old ship and you're painting it once. Well, no, they come in and they have maintenance on them because they're always out on the salt water. So you have maintenance on the inside, maintenance on the outside. It's pretty good business. It's repetitive. Automotive and specialty coatings, we're not in the big boxes. We're not in Ford, GM, uh, Tesla. We do repaints. We do automotive refinish. Industrial coatings is where I fall. There's coil and extrusion and packaging coatings. Wood coatings for your cabinetry. Uh, 
what else? Uh, trim and every so the wood coatings for your house, and then powder coatings. Some of the trade names here. A lot of the, those are overseas. Dulux, Trinar in the coil industry. 1050. I don't have that up there right now, but 1050 is a workhorse of Axel Nobel uh, for the agricultural business. Our coating facilities here, uh, just a snapshot picture. The main facility is in Columbus, Ohio. And we chose for it to be in Columbus, Ohio because it's central Midwest. And we have other facilities, though, that we can make coil products. And that would be in Waukegan and Pontiac. Huron makes our resins. And then Garcia, Mexico. We've invested more money into the Mex Mexico facility. But if you've been to Frame Builders a couple years ago, we did tours in Columbus and invested roughly $4 million in the last couple of years in an intermix system there, ADU unit. So we're constantly um, investing money. I'm moving from the Midwest to the South. And since my boss is here and his boss, I'm pleading again for an intermix system down south. So, you know, it's like, hey, bring the paint to me. So where are coil coatings applied? A lot of you know that there are metal roofing, uh, siding, garage doors, entry doors, above your head and the ceiling grid and the lighting fixture. It's kind of hard to see here in this picture, but we say, look, um, on some houses, the cupolas, the gutters, the downspouts, again, garage doors, entry doors, appliances, HVAC, and that's not just me, it's also my competition's involved in a lot of that, water heaters, so a lot of different products, can coatings that you don't realize besides just metal buildings. All right, we'll get up, uh, talk a little bit about what makes up a gallon of paint, and then how it affects your warranty. So. In a typical gallon of paint that goes to the coil coater that applies it to the steel and aluminum, a typical, typical gallon of paint is made up of 40 to 50% of solvent. That just burns off in the process. What's left is 25% of that gallon of paint, and these are rough numbers, is the pigment that gives it the color. And then the resin. And I'll get into the three resin systems that are mainly used in the industry. And here we go. So, with the first place metal there, the, the best product out there is PV, PVDF coatings, polyvinylidene fluoride coatings. Um, a lot of times you hear the name Trinar for Axel Nobel, my competition, Floripon for SW, but you also hear a lot of times um, Kynar or Hyvar. Well, those guys produce the resin that goes into the gallon of paint, but it's not all that name. But those are the two popular names that you hear all the time. And the product itself has superior gloss retention and color retention, but tends to be soft. It's softer than, the second place, silicone modified polyesters. Those are your S&Ps. They have excellent gloss retention. You know, I have a whole separate uh, uh, presentation on how much gloss is retained in the color retention, but they're also tougher coatings, they're harder. So they're great for installation on agricultural business. Um, where you got a lot of do-it-yourselfers and you know, you're dragging it you know, a couple hundred miles away from the plant and then installing it. It's also excellent to resist uh, dirt staining. You know, once you put a building out and the farmer starts uh, plowing the fields, you know you get a lot of dust and chemicals and it's very good resistance against that. It sheds it. And at the bottom is the polyesters. Polyesters are great products. They're used in almost all the garage door and entry door is polyester. Interior products, above your head, your washers, you know, gutters, downspouts, uh, are polyesters. So each one of these have a purpose in the industry. Each one has a price point, and it's what's best for your project. You know, do I need a non warranty shed for, you know, shade and shelter for animals. Hey, polyester, silicone polyester. But why go with the PVDF? You're spending too much money on that. So they have a purpose, they have a cost point. The other component that's tied into your warranty, so the resin, 
uh, is the backbone of the product. It holds things together to have better gloss retention and resisting chalk. The pigments give it color. Now, I was just talking to some people, I was a business major in college. So I'm not a chemist, but these also have a price point. Organics, inorganics, and ceramics. Organics are the cheapest, but they don't perform as well out in the field. Inorganic pigments are next, and ceramics are the best. They cost more. I got a coworker here that's doing a presentation at two o'clock, and he's going through paint 101, and he's a chemist. He'll be able to explain that a little bit better than me. But again, good, better, best, and pricing points on it. So, with that being said, there's many choices that you can do that you can pick out there. Again, it's what's best for your building. What kind of expectations do you have for that building? Do you want it to last 30, 40 years? Then go with your siliconized polyesters, your PVDF resins. So what's covered in a warranty is your film integrity. And I'll show you a picture of what, what I mean by film integrity. Color retention and chalk resistance. Most warranties from people out there, a paint company passes it on to the person making the panel. And then the panel manufacturer passes it on to the ultimate consumer. And again, the components of it, film integrity, which is usually longer than color retention and chalk resistance. So that number always sticks in everybody's head. Oh, I got a 40 year product, I got a 50 year product. But most of the time, it's for film integrity only. So when you go through and <clears throat> pick your paint system and your substrate, you want to pick and start at the beginning. So right here, and it's kind of hard to see, the metallic coating is this area right here, and then a pre-treatment, a primer, and a top coat. All carbon products start with base a base substrate. And then you could add um, zinc, gives you your hot dip galvanized G40, G60, G90, G100. And then you could also add a galvalume coating, which is a combination of zinc and aluminum. But I always tell everybody, more is better. The more galvan or the more metallic coating you can sell on your product, we're all gonna get less phone calls or possible claims. Because it protects that base substrate. And then the pretreatment. If you can ask for a zinc phosphate pretreatment, that's the best pretreatments out there. So a combination of all that gives you the best product out there that you can roll for them without it cracking and then peeling. And again, this part right here is just basically, we're saying, look, it's the best thing to resist sun, rain, and the UV, uh, UV rays attacking that uh, panel. So here's what's warrantable with film integrity. Now film integrity can go wrong for a couple reasons. It could be a substrate that the coil coder cannot clean, cannot properly pre-treat. It could be a paint company's problem that we have an inferior primer or top coat, so they're not sticking together and they peel off. It could also be the coil coder over-baking, under-baking the primer, and you get a problem. What you get, and this is a good picture one, and now they got a larger picture, blow it up. Oops. That here's an inner coat adhesion problem. Here's a problem. There it is. Still has primer on it. So if I was going out looking at this, I'd say, well, okay, it's stuck to the steel. What went wrong where the top coat didn't stick to the primer? Then you got to get everybody involved. Steel company, paint company, coil coder, and find out, hey, what went wrong with this? Is it my problem? Is it your problem? What are we going to do about it? Here's the other picture. You can see the blue right there at the ridges peeling off. You got to go back and build these cases. And in all scenarios, keep your records of where you bought your steel, the coil numbers, if you're roll forming it. Keep your coil numbers so you can backtrack all this to the original sourcing. Because as a paint company, we make batches every day. We keep those batch numbers. We know where they shipped. And then the coil coder 
tells us when they used it and on what steel. So if you have a problem in the field, it helps us all go back and rebuild the history and figure out what went wrong. Okay, so that's a film integrity. Now, color retention. It's kind of hard to see in here with the bright light, but this is your original color. This is a measurement of uh, National Bureau of Standards. It's, it's how you measure how many units it's changed, how much has it faded over a year. So what you do is you go out and you look at the building. If it was my company, we take out a color, a portable color meter. We would read it unwashed, then we would clean it and read it washed and come up with a number and figure out, hey, is it within warranty or is it out of warranty? So here's an example of a panel. It's from our test facility in Florida. That's the original color. There's the unwashed, there's the washed. And we measured it. It's faded 2.9 uh, units. It's well within anybody's warranty. On, on silicone polyesters, um, they're typically five on a, on a uh, wall and seven on a roof. And I'll show you what that all means here in a second. So chalk. Chalk is related to the resin system. And you guys have seen it probably before. It doesn't have to be white chalk. It can also take the pigment with it because the resin's breaking down and it can be a greenish color or a reddish color. That's chalking and that's when your resin is failing. So if you put a nice polyester product and it starts out bright red and you put it out on a steep roof, it's not going to look as good as a silicone polyester five years from now and you'll probably see chalking. Chalk is rated, uh, and I should have said this on fade, uh, and I got another slide. Fade, you want a low number. Low number is best. And on chalk, it's rated 0 to 10, 10 being the best. Now, this is more subjective test out in the field. It's an ASTM standard where you have to take certain felt or cheesecloth out there, and you start on the panel, and you go 180 degrees, and then go, oh, well, that looks like a six to me, so it's within warranty. Well, you could tell if somebody's pushing hard on it, you know? If you don't see their white knuckles like that, you know they're not applying a lot of pressure. So, I don't like the test, but it's standard. It's an it's a industry standard. So again, in the next slide I'll show you, and it's, what it shows here is, keep in mind, chalk is related to your resin, Fade is related to your pigments, and on a chalk rating, if you were reading your competition's warranty or yours, 10 is best, zero is really bad, and on the color units, a low number is good, and it could go out to infinity. I went to claim on a, on a West Coast job, and our uh, warranty manager, we went out, we read 28, and I've never seen anything like above an 8 or something. We read a 28. The people swear to us it was a green roof, and when we were there, it was yellow. And then, but we could read it and said, well, where'd you buy it? And they said, we don't know where we bought it. Uh, then it gets sticky. But it looked bad. So, what's not covered? Um, there's a lot of disclosures from the, or exceptions from the paint companies to the panel manufacturers. You know, I don't have them all listed up here, you know, acts of God, I mean, uh, fire. But it is a good fire-resistant coating. They're all, they're all class ones. Uh, mixing a different paint system, so touch on a few. If you put a PVD app out there and you put a polyester with it, they're not gonna look the same in three years. They're definitely not gonna look the same in five, six, seven years. The PVD app is gonna be looking better. That goes again, Keep your records of what you're doing because you might have sold some material to a contractor down the road. He had some old trim that might have been a polyester trim. He puts a PVDF roof on. Well, that roof's going to look great, but the trim is going to look bad. That's the mixing of different systems. You don't want to mix your competition. You don't want to mix my competition. Um, I could go over all those names, but you don't 
You don't want to mix an Axel system with one of my competitors because we can't control their process. Um, breaches in the coating, about the fourth, fourth one down, caused by scratches or impacts, dropping your hammer on it, you know, something. Scratching the material, I'll show you something else that's not covered, it's touch-up paint. So I'll show you some pictures of that. We do not cover corrosion. That goes back to the steel companies. So that very first one, corrosion, my company's warranty is not for corrosion, it's for what we can control. Uh, color, you know, fade, chalk, film integrity. So here's some pictures. Now animal confinement can be on the, this is a, the exterior of the building. Um, I see it a lot where some people piled up uh, manure or wet hay and then remove it. And they say, man, look, at, look what happened to your paint. And it's like, well, you held moisture in there for a long time. You know, um, here's an animal. And, then, and I show a picture of it blown up here in a minute. You can also get into animal confinement where you over insulated it and there's too much insulation. You put a lighter panel inside, and it's always trapping moisture inside those two panels, and you'll get corrosion. So there's the close-up of it. And it could be just grass clippings or something you'd put up there, straw, hay. Now this here, animal confinement does not have a warranty, and the steel guys, you could go around the show and ask them, they don't have warranties on animal confinement. There's just too many things you can't control. In this picture, there's the cross plates. There's your holes in the roof. Look at the wood. Uh, and plus it's the back side of the panel. The back side of the panel does not typically have any type of warranty. Here's some insulation scratches and debris left over. And again, I got the next slides will show it as a close up. But uh, there you are where they took the saw out, ridge cap, or the ridge cap's not on yet, but the ridge of the barn or, or house. Here's some uh, debris from it. Because remember that substrate starts as a carbon flat rolled sheet. It then has the coating on it. But once you cut that sheet, it's exposed and it will start to rust. If you can control it very slowly over time, it won't get holes. But you can't, it's not a perfect world where you can't, if there's a cut edge, it's gonna, it's gonna rust. Simple as that. So here's the close-ups. Uh, I've seen people cut through, they put a metal roof over an old asphalt shingle roof, so they're cutting through the old plywood, the asphalt shingles, and the new metal shingles. And that really creates a big old burr that drops down, and what's it doing 24 hours, 48 hours? It turns red. So there's nothing wrong with cutting in the field. Absolutely not. But you got to get the debris off of it. See those red, uh, red rust here? It'll wash off, but it discolored the paint a little bit. Uh, stacking panels and pre-drilling the holes. Uh, I framed houses as a kid growing up through college. I can guarantee you every wall I laid out, some of them might have been 16 inches, some of them might have been 17 inches with those studs. So if you pre-drill these holes and you don't clean up all the debris and you have to do it again when you're going out missing the stud, uh, it just causes problems. But that, you guys might have seen it before, you stack three or four together, pre-drill. And that, that shaving right there is like a, a little pig's tail, but that's your, that's your steel and then you get little red rust dots. Uh, wet stack storage. Wet stack storage is, if you've experienced it, it can get ugly. When you buy panels and you put them out in the field, there's white papers on it. You want them angled so the water can run off. You don't want to leave panels out there wrapped in plastic or just even on top of each other for a week, two weeks, you know, Hurricane Katrina down the south, when I worked for the other paint company, we had people putting standing seam roofs on a school that sat out there for six months down in Louisiana, in the heat, humidity, uh, moisture, and they all stuck together. 
because paint is porous and it will penetrate it over time if you leave it wet and trap that moisture in there. So that's peeling the panels apart and it took it all the way down to the substrate. You can see the red rust. Oops. So not covered. And see how it's all blistered? Just held that moisture in. And all and took the paint with it. Took the zinc coating with it. Air dry touch up. Um, this is always a fun one when you go out in the field. No, I never sprayed anything on it. No, I never took a brush to it. But a baked on coating that has that 30 year chalk and fade warranty, 40 year film integrity, is going to outlast any hardware store bought touch up paint. Because it's a water based acrylic. So you can see here a close up of where, okay, there was a scratch, things happened. Say, oh, let's take the brush and make it look good. That can, that can change in six months, depending on where you installed that film. It may last five years, and then you get a call. But touch-up paint is not covered by a full warranty as a baked-on coating. Some other issues that can happen that's uh, steel-related, you don't see this much anymore. When I got in the industry 30 years ago, some of the steel mills that don't exist anymore couldn't control their process. And so that's, called, that's a zinc, uh, you can call them draw slides or uneven, uneven zinc underneath the paint coating. Probably shouldn't have been painted, but it was. This right here is uh, uneven uh, zinc distribution where the panel's got, and when you put zinc on, if you have G90, it's 0.9 ounces of zinc per square foot, including the top side and the back side. So, um, I mean, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that's what I was taught. Right here, there's enough zinc coating. Right here, there's not, and it, and it would be repetitive. That's changed. Those are old pictures. Steel mills now, are, they're great. So, um, in closing, read the fine print of a warranty that you get passed on to you. Ask questions. Ask, what substrate am I getting? Am I getting G40 or am I getting G90? Am I getting AZ50 or AZ55? AZ30. Ask the pre-treatment. Ask where it's being painted. Whose paint system? If you favor one paint company over the other, specify it. Because if you don't, you might not get it. So ask those questions. And it's a, it's a team process between the steel companies, the paint companies, and the coil coders that apply it and the distribution centers, you know? So ask questions, don't be afraid to ask. To get more uh, information, if you'd like, we have, and, and then some of you have the capabilities, we have a, a, a Canopy app on Apple products. And you can download it and there's things on there, there's warranties, there's everything that we could give you on paper is on the Canopy app. National Coil Coders Association. So that's the coil coating companies that apply the paint. And then I, I could have put more up there with steel companies, you know, Steel Dynamics, US Steel. They have great websites and white papers that'll help you with installation, answer questions on coil coating process, uh, paint systems, cover things like I just said, good, better, best. So, and if you don't have some of those capabilities, you can reach out to me, come by the booth, sit down and chat with you. We can print some things and mail it to you. you know, that's, that's not a problem. So in closing, thank you for everything. Uh, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> All right. Good job. Hey, thanks. Um, again. I'll be at our booth, and there'll be other co-workers there at the Axel Nobel booth. And then uh, we got a presentation again at 2 o'clock today uh, to talk more in depth of some of the chemistries that I went through pretty quick. Um, and then again, I'll have some equipment with me if you want to see, if you've experienced something. And you're not, you're not going to always solve every client, trust me. You're, go ahead. What's the best touch up? Well... We have some great touch-up. 
but it's not cheap. And up until this last year, we could make it, but we weren't good at packaging it in little tins and little bottles. So we partnered with somebody and we sell what's called Ceramicryl. So it's got the same type of pigments that you do on the bacon, baked on coatings. And we got a new uh, partnership with a company that'll uh, go get the pins out the door in a, a week or two. And then there's big suppliers like Custom Aerosol down in Texas. And maybe there's two of our competitors. But you really don't want anything from just a water-based acrylic from a, a, a hardwood. SW has a good direct-to-metal uh, touch-up thing that they sell in the stores. I mean, it's just a cash, you know, it's pretty good. But it's just not going to last. So if you think you really need to get a half a gallon of touch-up paint, you probably ought to replace it. Because go off track. Want to touch it up? <laughs> but again, I can get you information on ours. You know, set up an account directly with that supplier. And some automotive uh, stuff's pretty good too. But it, it's not it's not cured in a controlled environment like the coil coating process. It's cured in 15 seconds. Down to 17 a minute, cures in 15 seconds, and it's going to last. I can show you demos that we had on some of the test fence for over 40 years. It was great. And it showed some of the help on it. It happens. We're not perfect. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. What's the ideal temperature to run a coil through a power wall? Should it be warm or faster than? Well, it depends on your, your whole process. If you're in a cold environment and it's oil stored in a cold environment, and you take it off and start to process it, it can crack. That's a, that's a thing. Um, warmer is better. But if it was really hot and it's a PDF coil, it might scratch it. So I'd say 70 degrees and above. But you know, there, there's a whole white paper on that. On uh, U.S. steel plus, not warm form. I know there's pro I know there's panel manufacturers here that believe in warm forming, but it's your whole process where you store the coil, what temperature you're building, uh, all the different variables. Warmer the better, but not too hot. Not a definitive answer. Anything else? And substrates. So, do most of your coil providers how do they handle that um, when you have a substrate issue? Well, I'll tell you from experience, typically the first person gets a phone call is the paper. And if it's not, if it's the coil coder or the steel source, you pull everybody together and try to figure it out. You pull everybody together as a team, and, and that's the best way I can do it. But if it's a substrate issue, you can still bring everybody together and we'll take a look at it or share information and try to figure it out. Put, put three heads together instead of one. So that's what I've experienced. Back to the temperature, um, we do a lot of uh, standing feed panels out on site. Mm -hmm. so sometimes we go out 20 degrees and run panels. So that's not an issue you think in that case. Well, it's also the configuration of the panel and your cooling. And uh, no, you know, you see people out there working at the computer. Room, so you got to get the job done. But uh, now, and is it is it a silicone polyester or a PVDF? No, PVDF. Yeah. No, it, it, it should still work. But you, and a lot of times it happens when you're cooling. You know, if you're not keeping your cooling, uh, lubricating it up a bit. And Sort of Anything else? Hope I didn't step out of line for one of the other partners in the industry at all. So I just know a little bit of the other stuff that substrate what have you, but you know, it's a it's an amazing industry that every year, even in the bad years, we still do hundreds of thousands of tons of paint and metal and all. Every year. I think one day I'm going to wake up, I'm going to have a retired, and every roof's going to have a metal roof on Every house will have a metal roof on it. 
But we still really haven't, we still only, we're not really a double digit figure to this depend on who you're talking to. There's, there's a lot of less for us. Pros and cons, but it's just when am I gonna maybe look down from a plane or wake up from a dream and go, Did anything clad in metal? You know? so, so that's when you can retire. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope yeah, so. so uh, enjoy the show. I know it's exciting that people are out doing things now. And uh, please stop by our booth. Uh, we have to take in the uh, two o'clock presentation. But, I'm out at the booth and you see me around the show, just stop me and chit chat. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.